Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our 39th session of the Med AI Group Exchange. This week, we have Max Lu from MIT here with us to present his work on weekly supervised large scale computational pathology. Max is a first year computer science PhD student at MIT, advised by Dr. Faisal Mahmoud, currently interested in computational pathology and spatial biology. He obtained his BS degree in biomedical engineering and applied math and statistics from Johns Hopkins University. Thank you, Max, for joining us today. Before we start, could you tell us your preference on how you want to take questions? Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, so if, if folks have questions, feel free to um, leave them in the chat or, you know, at, at the end, I think I'm probably only going to be talking for 30 to 40 minutes. So hopefully we'll have time um, at the end for questions as well. But, yeah. Great. So yeah, let's try to make this session as interactive as possible with great audience participation. Without further ado, let's let me hand it over to Max. Okay. Yeah. So I'll share my screen. Does this look okay to everyone? Okay. Yeah. So uh, thanks for the intro. So, um, you know, my name is Max, currently a first year PhD student at MIT. Um, and so today I'll be going over some of the research projects that I did before starting my PhD, which were most, mostly on weekly supervised computational pathology. Um, so um, as some folks might already know, there has been tremendous progress in uh, whole site imaging for um, pathology over the past decade. Uh, that nowadays pathologies and researchers um, have the option to just view histological specimens at a very high resolution right on their computers. So, you know, the recent advances in computer vision and general machine learning also helped fuel the interest in performing uh, large scale quantitative image analysis based on these whole site images, uh, both for knowledge discovery and uh, to potentially assist in clinical decision making. Um, you know, however, one of the, the challenges is that it's simply too computationally expensive, if not intractable. To perform inference on uh, entire whole set of images, or I'll refer to them as WSIs in the rest of this presentation. Um, so, uh, in the raw pixel space, so for, for, for reference, uh, state of the art computer vision algorithms are typically designed to operate on small natural images, roughly a few hundred pixels by a few hundred pixels in size, uh, which is like the size of like uh, this one tiny region, uh, you know, zoomed in uh, on this whole set of image over here. So, um, this is an example from the early days of the chameleon challenge for lymph node metastasis detection, where pathologists um, provide a detailed annotation for which regions represent lesions. And so uh, what we refer to as sort of these fully supervised computational pathology methods, which are, uh, had been very popular in the early days, is that uh, training time, um, the authors will just randomly extract small patches from each WSI and then train a model to classify which patches are you know, tumor, which are normal, according to the annotation provided. And then at test time, the model will just take like a sliding window approach to um, look at every single look at every single region in the entire slide to predict how likely each location connects tumor. And these individual predictions are you know, finally aggregated to produce some sort of slide level prediction um, as the model's final um, uh, prediction. So, uh, you know, to, to summarize the general workflow for uh, fully supervised methods for computational pathology uh, typically involves a pathologist annotating images at the RI or pixel level. Um, you can then train a predictive model such as a CNN on these um, regions of interest. Uh, and then finally, you can aggregate these local uh, scoring uh, or predictions into slide or patient level prediction at test time. Um, so the issue with this approach um, is that collecting detailed annotations is for each slide is typically not part of a hospital's routine. And so it's extremely tedious and expensive to ask pathologists to provide such information uh, in order just to train a machine learning model. And as some later works have pointed out, if you train a model on a small, well annotated data set, uh, you know, there is a risk that it might perform very well on similar data, but then uh, completely fail to generalize to diverse external test cohorts, uh, which is, you know, something that's very much expected um, um, that people in the machine learning community have struggled with you know, uh, for a long time. So, um, so instead, you know, typically what happens is that each institution has a large archive of slides with diagnoses and other outcomes assigned at the slide or patient level. And since it would be unreasonable to request an expert to annotate all of them, um, this begs the question of whether we can train accurate diagnostic or prognostic, prognostic models without requiring RI level annotations. Um, 
And the answer is uh, yes, but it just means that, you know, effectively each WSI becomes a single labeled data point. And that's basically all the supervision uh, we're gonna be able to get without making additional assumptions about the data in the task. So uh, to do weekly supervised learning, um, you don't have access to RI level annotation. One very simple assumption that people make uh, is that we can just tile the whole set image into multiple small regions. The slide level label can just carry over to each and every single tile. We call this um, uh, the same label assumption. And it was actually found to be quite effective for some tasks such as the classification of non-small cell lung cancer on the TCGA data. Uh, specifically at training time, uh, we can just consider a learnable mapping from each tile to its corresponding slide level label. So for example, if a slide is adenocarcinoma, we just split it into tiles and teach a CNN to recognize each and every single tile to be adenocarcinoma. And at, at test time, very similar to this fully supervised example I showed earlier, we just run the per tile CNN on all the tiles and then aggregate their predictions to get some sort of uh, side level prediction. So uh, it might be a reasonable, this, so the this same level assumption might be reasonable if you know a priori that the task is such that you can infer the correct side level outcome from each individual tile independently, and, and that the content of the slide is relatively homogeneous with respect to the outcome. Um, so, however, it's not really valid for many real world tasks. So as an example, uh, and, and then if you assume this assumption for those tasks, uh, you're gonna introduce a lot of label noise, um, just intuitively, if you train your model this way. So for example, if lymph node metastasis detection is your, is your task, uh, the lesion might constitute just a very small fraction of the lymph node. And so if a slide is positive, it would be uh, unreasonable uh, to teach the model to classify every single region in the slide to be positive. Uh, if you if you use it for such problems, the model might not learn anything useful uh, at all. Um, so, um, an, another choice for weekly supervised learning was to use what's known as multiple multiple instance learning or the MIL assumption, uh, which treats each slide as a set of tiles, and then each tile has like an unknown but binary label, and the slide is positive if at least one of the tiles is positive. So you know effectively, uh, in the in the binary setting of tumor versus uh, normal, you're saying that if I can find tumor somewhere on the slide, then it should be classified as positive. Um, but if I, if I checked everywhere and nowhere do I find tumor, then it's, it's a negative case, which makes sense. Uh, so the folks at, who were at MSK at the time uh, did a very large scale study following this assumption. And the way they train our model is to uh, classify tumor versus non-tumor. Um, they first make a prediction for each and every single tile on a slide. And then they take the tile with the highest prob uh, predicted probability for tumor as a prediction for the slide. Um, so um, the, 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 some limitation is that um, it just requires, a, the way they implement it, it requires just like a large amount of compute because you're taking multiple forward passes during training. And it's inflexible uh, to at least uh, in a sense, like you can't directly apply the multiple instance learning assumption to problems besides um, binary classification. And then lastly, another important consideration is data efficiency. So using MIL, in each iteration of the model update, we're only learning from a single patch. So namely the patch with the highest predicted tumor probability. And as a result, uh, the algorithm might need like a very large amount of data to learn effectively uh, because your gradient signals can be very noisy uh, coming from a single patch. And um, so, so you know, effectively people show that you need typically on the order of thousands, if not tens of thousands of slides uh, just to do well on some relatively simple tasks. And so it would be important to uh, improve the data, data efficiency of our learning algorithm in situations for uh, um, situations such as like rare condition classification or you know clinical trials where we don't have that many patients um, um, as um, the setting that the authors work with in the study. So to recap, here's like a list uh, of what we might want to see in an approach for doing large scale with supervised computational pathology. Um, so we wanted to not have to rely on time-consuming manual annotation without requiring uh, very strong assumptions about the task, uh, flexible to different kinds of tasks, um, does not necessarily require thousands of slides for easy problems, um, and then being able to adapt to data from multiple sources, uh, as well as being computationally efficient, scalable, and easy to use. So, um, so next, I'll just uh, walk through the framework that we initially proposed to address these challenges. Um, I probably won't go through all the details, but feel free to read our paper and then also ask questions and reach out if you're uh, interested in our truth aspect. So 
the idea is to first um, seg seg use segmentation to identify regions of tissue uh, for the simple re reason that like um, a huge portion of the image, the slide is just going to be uh, white space and background. So for computational efficiency, we'll, we'll just want to get rid of those white space. So after doing segmentation, we then divide those regions into small patches, just like the previous approaches have done, um, as shown here. Um, and then to overcome the computational bottleneck of running inference in the raw pixel space, what we do is we first do embedding, uh, which is just like a you know, seemingly uh, fancy way of saying that we want to represent each patch as a fixed dimensional vector. Um, and then we want the embedding dimension to be much lower than the number of pixels in each patch uh, in order to make, uh, make the whole pipeline compute, compute tractable. So basically the problem can be broken down into two steps where the first step is dimensionality reduction. And then the second step, we're able to do supervised learning directly on the entire whole set image in the low dimensional uh, embedding space. So as to how we actually perform the embedding. So initially we thought we need to do some kind of uh, self-supervised learning to do uh, to learn good low dimensional representation of our images. Um, and you know, my first work was actually like a workshop paper that did this uh, using at the time, like contrastive learning, like one of the earliest methods um, for self-supervised learning, learning based on contrastive learning. Um, but then later we found out that it turns out you can just take CNNs pre-trained on natural images for image classification uh, and use the encoder part of the classification uh, systems and to directly embed the histology image patches. And then, and then in most cases, we'll actually do uh, just as well, if not better in some cases, than if you uh, naively sort of do some kind of self-supervised learning pre-training. Um, and in, so in particular, at the time, we uh, used a very slightly modified version of the ResNet 50. Um, so it's basically a ResNet 50, but truncated after the third residual block. Um, such that you will get like a 1024 dimensional feature vector, um, which we use to embed each 256 by 256 patch. So uh, the reason we chose this architecture is that, you know, in, in, intuitively or empirically, people have found that for CNNs, the the deeper layer, the deeper you go in terms of the, the, the number of layers, um, it becomes more specialized for the target task. So in, in this case, the, tar the target task was originally for um, classification on ImageNet. So we found that if you uh, use the whole CNN, it actually does not lead to any improvement uh, in the performance. And also uh, you're, you have to work with like a larger dimensional feature space, uh, which is trickier and more computationally um, expensive to do. So since our main goal for doing this step is just to do dimensionality reduction, uh, we, we just use the, the, the first three residual blocks of the ResNet. Um, so, after embedding, we use um, an intention mechanism to aggregate the information across all regions in the slide. So the idea here is that we teach a model to score each patch based on how informative it is for inferring the slide level or patient level label. Um, we then take a, like a convex combination of flow embedding vectors into and merge them into a single whole slide level embedding, where the patches that were deemed informative and received a higher attention score are weighted more heavily. Uh, so now we have a uh, just a single low dimensional representation of the entire whole set image. Now all we need to do finally is to do regression with a linear classifier to predict the label for the, the whole set image. Um, so this aggregation procedure here is known as attention pooling. Uh, and together with the classification layer, um, these are fully differentiable operations with respect to the parameters of the machine learning model. So you can just learn this using gradient descent, just like regular supervised learning. Um, so da -da -da -da. Yeah, so to summarize, um, we take the image patches within the tissue regions, embed them with a pre-trained encoder, assess the relative importance using an attention module, and then aggregate them into a single slide of repetition by taking their convex combination using the attention scores as weights. Um, and then the network finally makes prediction for the entire slide based on this compact slide level repetition. And there's some additional tricks we use during training to get like a minor boost in performance and make the algorithm more data efficient. But um, for the interest of time, I will not go over them. Uh, for the for those interested, you know, feel free to read our paper or visit our GitHub page to play around with the code. Um, so, uh, in the paper, we benchmark our method against um, at the time several common methods based on the the assumptions that I introduced earlier for weekly supervised learning. So, the MIO assumption and the same level assumption, um, and we benchmark uh, our method uh, uh, across different sizes of training sets and also different classification tasks. Uh, namely, renal cell carcinoma subtyping, uh, non-small cell lung cancer subtyping using the uh, TCGA data and also lymph node metastasis detection for breast cancer using the public chameleon challenge. So shown here, uh, blue is our method and then 
the red and yellow are the MIL and same uh, label assumption. So on the y-axis for each task, you'll see is the um, AUC score on the held out test set across 10 different runs. And then on the x-axis is um, basically as we vary the size of the training set. Um, so, it, um, so when you move from um, left to right, the training set size uh, progressively increases. So as you can see, um, our method, which we call CLAM, um, uh, does give you a boost in performance ranging from a few percent to a quite large gap in some cases when training set becomes um, really small, suggesting it's much more data efficient. And we also additionally validated um, the method uh, of the models on an independent test cohort collected from the Brigham and Women's Hospital and then observed similar trends. So we're quite encouraged to see that the models trained on the public data from TCGA were able to uh, in fact, generalized to um, our BWH data with typically very minor degradation in the performance. So another thing we did was just to map the attention scores of that our model assigned to each embedding uh, back into space and investigate what the model is using to inform its prediction. So here, high attention regions are colored in red and low attention regions are shaded in blue. And we were able to validate with the help of pathologists that for the most part of the model's attention aligns well with what we would expect, uh, uh, which is that to, in order to classify or detect tumor, it should assign high attention weights to various types of tumor morphologies and largely ignore the background and uh, uh, no, the normal tissue. So uh, in the paper, we in fact take it one step further and found that you can make the models, take the models pre-trained on uh, resected tissue and apply them to biopsy data or cell phone microscopy data and still get reasonable performance. So this could be valuable since I heard pathologists sometimes like to take pictures on their phone um, and then look at those cases under the microscope, uh, which is typically a lot more accessible than expensive scanners used to digitize whole site images. So if we can train accurate models on whole site images uh, and readily deploy them to uh, microscope, uh, cell phone microscopy images, uh, this could potentially open up opportunities for telepathology and AI-assisted diagnoses in low resource settings. Um, so we did some validation uh, on this where we apply the models that we trained um, directly to cell phone images for the um, renal cell carcinoma and non-small cell lung carcinoma uh, specimens captured at 20x under a microscope. Um, and encouragingly, even though there is definitely a significant uh, performance hit, we were still able to achieve AUCs in the high 80s and low, uh, low 90s. Um, and uh, you know, further, you can see that the attention module in the, in the network is still uh, actively trying to attend to tumor regions in, the, in these cell phone images um, and use them to uh, inform this prediction. So in summary, we break down the problem um, of weekly supervised computational pathology into two stages. So namely representation learning and embedding, followed by supervised learning in the reduced low dimensional space. So in principle, you can try to use self-supervised learning to actually learn a good set of embeddings of your data set. And, and um, you know, there's a lot of works um, currently um, in the field that are trying to do that. Uh, but in practice, we still find that just using a pre-trained encoder to be highly effective for many tasks. Um, and it's also worth mentioning that um, by doing embedding first, we upfront a huge portion of the comp computation. So once we have the low embedding latent space representation of the, of, of the data, we no longer need original images for the purpose of inference and training. So um, you know, model training and inference can com be computed very quickly. So it is very easy to scale this method to uh, tens or perhaps even hundreds of thousands of slides, uh, which we'll provide an example of uh, uh, later. So um, just like a quick uh, uh, a word I'd like to mention. So the code for this whole pipeline is publicly available. So we encourage people to try it out for their own problems and data sets, um, or just like modify it uh, for the purpose of research. Um, and then in the interest of time, I'll just say maybe like a few words about prognosis. So. Uh, namely, besides the classification task that we sort of alluded to earlier, it's quite easy to use the same pipeline to do survival prediction. Uh, we have a few papers and preprints that in fact do this, uh, and you're welcome to check them out. But effectively, it just comes down to the parameterization of the model. So um, instead of the, um, for classification, the last layer of the network sort of models class probabilities, and then uh, we you know minimize the KL divergence, for example, between the, the pred uh, predicted probabilities and the, and the ground truth label uh, distribution. Um, so to do survival prediction, you just have to, uh, for example, mod, uh, change the loss function to um, use some kind of a likelihood um, model for uh, your survival model. 
and then it will work just fine. And then as you can see in some of the papers um, that we published on this. So, um, and similar to classification. May I ask a also, question here? Yeah. Sorry. Um, so, so, so in, in this, basically in this paper, you uh, discretize the survival time into bins and then um, make the model to predict, is it, is it like a multi-class? Multi prediction of the survival time or um, so, regression? So, so yeah, so it's not quite a classification, what, but what we're doing is that we're, we're discretizing it into, into bins and then we use the, uh, uh, the log likelihood function that corresponds to a discrete survival um, model. So there's, um, you know, things like there's like the hazard function, which I believe is like, you know, given the patient has lived up to this time interval, how likely is it that it's going to die in this or pass away in this instance? And then the survival function is like, oh, okay, like what's the actual survival probability? So what we do, like, so if you if you model the last layer of your uh, network at, um, as like the hazard function, so, so basically then for each node, so you have each one node for each uh, discrete bin that you sort of define for the task. And then each node will output like, a, I believe it's like a value between zero and one, which corresponds to the conditional um, probability of like survival or, or, or death, um, given that the patient has sort of survived up till that point. Um, and then there's like a corresponding likelihood uh, function you can uh, maximize or, you know, minimize if you're using the ne negative uh, log likelihood function um, and taking into account like censoring or whatnot. And then you can train the model um, just using like a very similar setup as we talked about earlier. I see. Uh, yeah. so, so do you find this loss function more beneficial than like some regression with loss functions, like cost regression or? um yeah similar survival so we've actually not uh tried other loss functions i guess like one of the reasons we pick this particular setup is just um so one one limit i guess one computational limitation of our method is that like because each whole set image has like a different like you know the, the, the tissue area is different so if, mm -hmm. if you're using fixed size tiles you're gonna get potentially a very different number of tiles across different training examples. And, and you know, you, of course you can do some kind of clever, uh, you know, padding and sort of uh, batching to stick multiple slides into a single mini batch, um, but just like, or, or, you know, do like distributed training or, or whatnot, but like from like an implementation, ease of implementation perspective, uh, it was sort of really easy to just use like a batch size of one. And, and we didn't find any issue with that. Um, um, when, when doing the classification task we did. So for, for, for survival, I believe like one, one common loss one people use is like the Cox, uh, like proportional hazard model. Right. But then for mm -hmm. that, like you need, you need like a, like you, you can't do it with the batch size of one. Uh, so, yeah, exactly. so, so yeah. yeah, so, so, so to overcome that issue, that's why we like, we, we sort of just did a little bit of research and found this model and then it's, you know, it works reasonably well. Uh, so we haven't actually like tried other methods, um, for, for survival prediction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, just like in the last half of my talk, I just want to shift gears and talk about like a specific application of our pipeline, which uh, is to predict the primary origins of CEPs. So, uh, which is you know stands for cancers unknown primary. So, CEP broadly categorizes cancers where um, a primary origin cannot be determined, uh, and most believe that identifying and the primary tumor and providing site-specific treatment will lead to improved patient outcomes. And this is currently in like an active area of research. So when patients are diagnosed with a CUP, they typically undergo an extensive workup in the hopes of identifying the origin. And this could be a very time-consuming and resource-intensive process, uh, potentially at the expense of treating the patient in a timely manner. Um, and it's also not always successful. So in light of this, there has already been like a handful of recent works um, predicting the origin based on molecular information. Uh, and um, you know, my research at the time hoped to help clinicians in this complex diagnostic process uh, using just routine HNE histology, so that it can appeal to a much wider range of hospitals, hospitals and services, including in low resource settings. Um, so, so the study design uh, is such that we um, develop our method using over twenty two hundred thousand patient slides of. Uh, primary and metastatic cancers with known primary. Um, and this data set was curated from both uh, our internal pathology archive, as well as public data sources, such as the CPTAC and uh, the TCGA. And then we then evaluate our model on a HADAL test set of um, around 6,500 
cases, as well as an external test set of cases submitted from uh, US and international medical centers. And then lastly, we uh, were able to identify a multi-center data set of CP cases of which 317 um, out of the 743 in total cases had a primary differential assigned. So we used these cases to um, assess our model performance on CPs. So um, in total, we used around 32,000 uh, whole set images from TCG, ACP, TAC, and in-house pathology database. And then um, shown on this slide, and each bracket will indicate the uh, number of primary metastatic sites with, uh, respectively for um, each of the 18 primary origins that we considered. Um, so our method, as mentioned, uses weekly supervised learning, so therefore does not require any manual annotations, and we'll just directly operate on whole set images using the slide level labels. So for classification, we use the um, both the patient's gender in addition to uh, information from the histology slide, a mixed prediction for both the primary origin as well as whether the tumor is metastatic or primary. And you can find, once again, find the code available on our GitHub page. Um, so for predicting the primary origin of tumors, um, the model achieved like an over accuracy of over 83% um, on the combined test set of primary metastatic cases. And additionally, we also assessed the model's K performance, um, which uh, just measures how often the model's K highest confident predictions contain the true label. And we note that the models uh, achieved a top three accuracy of over 90%. So the model generalizes also reasonably well to um, the external test set and is able to achieve a similar level of performance. And then shown on the right, we looked at the model's ability to distinguish primary from metastatic tumors across a number of tissue sites. Um, the AUC of this binary prediction task varies by site, but mostly range from the mid 80s to 90s. Um, so we, you know, we then examined more closely the model's predict, uh, performance on just the metastatic tumors in our test set. So the confusion matrix shown on the left um, shows that the, the, the model accurately predicts most tumor origins. Um, and um, once again, it's able to achieve like an over accuracy of like over 82.8% and top three accuracy of over 90% on the metastatic cases, which is consistent with the performance shown earlier on the entire test set. So in this figure, we also use the, um, on the right, we also use the number of diagnostic IHCs used, uh, whether things like whether clinical correlation was recommended, and poor differentiation as like criteria to identify further subsets of more challenging metastatic cases in order to evaluate our model. Um, and as mentioned before, um, our model can provide human interval heat maps that show the regions considered by the model to have high diagnostic relevance and those have low diagnostic relevance. And this can help the human user verify how the model predictions are based on tumor regions on the side and understand which regions uh, is using to make its predictions. So uh, in this slide, as an, as an example, we show representative, representative examples of uh, colorectal cancer spread to the lung, lymph node, and liver. Um, so, and in, in a related analysis, we also quantify the cellular pop, uh, populations captured by the model's high attention regions and confirm that indeed, um, you know, the, the model's predictions were predominantly made from uh, tumor cell containing regions. So we also have this interactive demo that you can go check out, um, which just has like a bunch of cases um, from the test set. Uh, in, in addition to the H and E slide and the diagnosis, we also have some model predictions as well as the uh, the attention heat map. So this is just kind of like a dummy tool that we created to showcase my um, what this my uh, looks like and sort of like a um, you know AI assisted um, diagnostic setting for clinicians. Um, but you know it's just in the, it's very early stages, so you know we definitely need to do a lot more work if uh, this is going to have like any real world uh, value in the clinic. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's pretty interesting. You should check it out. So um, so lastly, we looked at the model's predictions for CEP cases that were assigned a primary differential and how often they agreed with the differential diagnosis assigned. Uh, so we noted an agreement between the model's top prediction and the primary differential in around 60% of the cases, um, while the top three agreement is over 80%. So additionally, based on the language used in pathology reports and the um, EMRs, we divided diagnoses into um, that were assigned into high certainty and low certainty um, and witnessed a much higher agreement within the pool of high certainty cases. Um, so high, cer high certainty diagnoses were basically defined as those 
um, that says something along the lines of like being compatible on the basis of, of um, IHC finding findings for clinical radiological molecular correlation, whereas low certainty diagnoses um, for the most part included cases that may not suggest a specific primary or lack definitive supporting evidence for the putative differential assigned. So, um, you know, in terms of clinical utility in advanced clinical settings, um, one helpful use case that we imagined would be to um, possibly interpret the model's top three year predictions uh, as like a differential and combine them with the pathologist's expertise and IHCs to make faster, potentially more accurate diagnoses. So here's the CUP case, for example, in the database that we found where the physician arrived at malaria origin as preferred uh, primary differential. Uh, but then similarly, uh, if you use the model, you can get the top three predictions. And then to confirm the diagnoses, um, the pathologist will order IHCs to rule out the other poss possibilities as well as potentially referring back to the clinical history, um, check the regions um, that a model used for um, its, its prediction, uh, and then arrive at the same conclusion, but potentially um, faster and using less resources. Um, so, you know, lastly, I just want to uh, thank Faisal, the entire lab and sponsors that enabled the projects to happen um, and everyone who helped me along the way. So all the co-authors are, are listed um, here on the right and it would not have been possible uh, without their contribution. So um, we're also just like a pretty relatively new lab. So we're always looking for new postdocs and trainees to join our group. So if you're interested, feel free to get in touch with us. Um, but yeah, that's the end of my talk and uh, feel free to reach out if you have questions. Great, thank you so much. Before we go into a Q and session, let's all give uh, Max a round of virtual applause. Thanks for the very uh, interesting talk, uh, presenting a lot of like very relevant and clinically um, valuable papers. All right, so let's now open the ground for questions. Does anyone have any questions? Um, uh, I have. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Ramon. I can ask my name. Um, can you go to um, the attention-based slide where you're training the model? Um, so when you were talking about um, getting the attention scores based on the label, is the label the cancer label or? some other um yeah so that's this slide that you're referring to okay yeah. sure yeah yeah so what by informative it's informative towards the um let's say the type of cancer or some other label in particular uh yes yeah, so it's, it's just whatever the the label that um is like basically whatever task you're training right so if it's detecting cancer then you know basically which the, the question we're asking is like which regions in the slide will actually contribute uh, information towards inferring that label, right? So, you know, when, when, you, when, you, when you say a slide is, is a certain type of tumor, um, that doesn't mean like every single region you look in the slide is gonna be representative or characteristic of the label, right? So a huge amount of regions you're gonna see in the slide are actually just gonna be, you know, potentially normal regions or sometimes you have to breathe um, or like pen marking for whatnot. Um, so, you know, intuitively those things should not uh, be, those should not provide much value towards your uh, your your inference pipeline, and and so this 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 thing here basically just says, well, okay, we're only going to select uh, regions that actually are characteristic of our label, um, and then ignore all the rest. Um, but then you want to do it in a way such that it's fully differentiable. So you know, it, it, it's an interesting question because I think there's been some recent works that actually explore. Uh, so this is you know like a typical self like soft attention setup, right, where you look at every single region in the slide. Uh, you compute its relevance and then you do like a convex combination uh, to, to do this pooling operation. Um, and so this thing is, you know, no problem. This is fully differentiable. You can train it using gradient descent. Uh, you can also do what's known as hard intention where you just say, okay, well, I just want to select like the top one or like the top two uh, most relevant patch. And I want to see what's there and, and, and make a prediction based on that. Uh, and you, you can certainly do that too. It's just, the issue is just that when you select, you know, when you do like top K indexing, that, that operation is not, uh, uh, differentiable with respect to your model parameters, but there's tricks you can use to um, actually get around it um, and, and 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 be able to do still do training using uh, gradient-based methods. So there, there's a few I think papers that are trying to do that right now, but it's still an active area of research. Thank you. Yep. 
Um, I had a couple of questions, Max. Um, great talk. Yeah. Um, actually, maybe uh, since Ramon asked this question, I just have a follow-up question in the same um, slide before I move on to my mm -hmm. next question. So sure. in this, you said you use the pre-trained encoder to completely, like, basically move away from the image um, to actually just the 1024 vector space. And so mm -hmm. when you actually get these attention scores, how do you... Um, like, do you actually pass the gradients back through the pre-trained encoders or um, how do you do this mapping from the, the, the load dimensional vector and back to the image when, where you showed this uh, really nice um, attention heat map for your images? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think the, the heat maps we show are um, pretty coarse in the sense that like, you know, it's just one score per per patch, right? So it's not it's not necessarily gonna tell you like, oh, given that this patch had high attention, um, you know, where where is the the where the model is actually looking, right? So oh, you, I, see. I think in, yeah. So in principle, I think you could still do that, right? I mean you can you can still use like things like uh, you know like grad cam or whatnot and then pass the gradient like from the attention scores all the way back through the ResNet pre-train encoder to each pixel in the image. Uh, it's just that not it's, it's just not something that like I personally have have done. I think uh, it would be interesting to explore that. I think people other people in my lab might have done that, but mm -hmm. I'm not sure if there's like any works that they've like already published that does this. So um, I don't want to like comment and say that I'll get to go check out this paper. Um, but yeah, it's 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 a it's a good question. Hope that gotcha. clarifies. Yeah. So yeah. if I understand correctly, so basically you are focusing attention on specific patches. So the the resolution is at the patch scale. Exactly. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Um, and then uh, the second question was was more on the the second part of your talk, um, mm -hmm. where you are trying to find the primary, um, like basically the region. Um, so is it is it the case that um, a like a specific like can 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 the primaries is it only from one single primary? Is it a multi-label classification or do you treat it as um, like it can be at most just one class? So it cannot originate from the lung as well as from, I don't know, the breast. So how did the problem setting evolve and how does it actually work in, in practice? Um, so I, I can't comment on like the multiple primary thing. Just, I mean, I feel like I don't have the, the clinical knowledge to answer that question, but. I believe it potentially is possible. Like, you know, like you can have like tumor that metastasize to, so, so yeah, so, so a single tumor can definitely, I think metastasize to multiple locations. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if it would, I'm not sure if it's possible for a tumor to, let's say like migrate first to like one primary and then like it has to like a different, oh, sorry. I'm, I'm not sure if it's possible for, or, or common for, for a, a primary tumor to first metastasize it to one location and then like then pass to a different, location. I feel like even if that is possible, it's probably gonna it's probably quite rare and you're not gonna have a lot of mm -hmm. data points like that in the data set. Um, but in, in any case, like so so for when, when we looked at this problem, it's just uh it's just completely like a single um it's just like a simple multi-class. Um so yeah yeah so it's it's not multi-label. So each uh slide will just be assigned like a single primary. Yeah. I see. And so a, a pathologist can basically just look at the slide and then um, know where the origin was, or is that um, is that more nuanced than? It's it's definitely more nuanced. So from what I heard, um, a uh, there so to some degree, the morphology of the primary tumor will be preserved when it metastasizes to different locations. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, if the the morphology is sort of like clear um, and characteristic of a specific primary to build, mm -hmm. like I, from my understanding of logic I'm gonna be oh okay I think that I suspect this is probably from you know, this primary um but that said like you know first of all there are multiple um primary tumors like from different primaries that morphologically will look similar mm -hmm. and also a lot of times the trickiest thing is that your tumor is like you know poorly differentiated or something in which case it's actually not really clear at all like you know what primary it sort of resembles so typically uh, in the clinic, I think for uh, metastatic tumors, it's pretty much always, I want to say, um, you would order like additional like IHC stains just based on like mm -hmm. sort of what people have found over the years of like, oh, like, you know, this, this stain is like um, 
diagnostic of like this perfect tumor. And 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 once again, I, from my understanding, those are also not like mutually exclusive, right? Like there's not necessarily mm -hmm. like a like a single thing that will say, oh, it you know it confirms this primary and rule, rules rules out all the other, right? It's like typically people, um, if you want to get into like there's like a whole algorithm like <laughs> flow chart of like what you should do uh, to order these panels of IHCs to 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 sort of get at what the primary is. So yeah, it's definitely a pretty complex decision making process. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so Max, I remember in your plan paper, um, in the methods, um, you actually include some type of clustering, uh, in addition to the attention, right? Uh, could you, yeah, could you like elaborate on that? Yeah. So I think at the time, my thinking was just that I like, um, you know, the, 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 uh, when you do attention based pooling, right? So even though you are getting a gradient signal from all the patches uh, in, in, your, in your slide, right? Because it's like, it's doing soft attention. Um, at a certain point, you know, it, it's, it's what, what we found is that the, the attention distribution becomes very sharp, right? So it's, it's likely only using, it's, it's likely assigning just high, assigning very high scores or tensions to a few locations in the slide and then sort of ignoring um, the other one. So, you know, in, in that case, you know, even though technically it's, it's, there is a gradient signal for every patch, those gradients are, you know, pretty much zero, right? So it's not necessarily learning from the other regions in the site anymore. And I think, I don't, I'm not sure if this is like totally the right way to think about it, but like one scenario, which um, that I think you could sort of imagine that um, this method, like this phenomenon would be uh, insufficient, would be like, let's say you have uh, for a single class, right? You might have different types of morphology that are characteristic. Um, of of, the, of that class, so there is probably like some. There's probably like a primary uh, morphology that's like sort of clear and like that's like very characteristic and appears in like ninety percent of the cases. But there might be like another morphology that's only present in like ten percent of the cases. So you know, if depending on how large your training set is, or 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 um, oh sorry, and you know sometimes you know both morphologies can coexist in the same slide. So um, depending on how large your training set is, I mean the model might find it convenient be like oh but you know from a frequency perspective uh, I just need to pick out that first type of morphology right and 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 you know because my training set is an income it's, it's not it doesn't cover the whole distribution and all of the the cases where um, the rare morphology appears I also have the, the first more common morphology in which case you know all I have to do is to attend assign high attention to the first more common morphology, and I can I can just zero out the other morphology, right? I can just assign a zero attention score to that, and I should I should still be able to at least in training be able to do very well. Um, the issue becomes that then you know what what if at test time you encounter a sample uh, and that's that just has a second type of morphology, right? Then 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 you know your your attention network might not have been trained to recognize it at all, uh, and in which case your classifier will most likely fail. Um, so the idea I had, which I'm not necessarily sure it fully addresses this issue, but it's just like my attempt, which is that, okay, so um, what if we, instead of just, you know, using the, the attention score that the model, uh, the patches that the model sort of attended to, we actually uh, use, like, we use that to like assign like pseudo labels, right? So like the top, the, say the top K and the top, uh, the top K patches, the attention uh, model selected, those are likely to be uh, representative of the class one way or another. Um, and then the, the bottom K, uh, even though I don't know for sure, uh, they're probably like garbage that you can just toss away and ignore. Um, and, and, and this happens not just for a single slide, but also happens across slides as well, right? So, you know, um, if, I have, if, if I'm working with like a multi-class problem, the top attended uh, patches from, let's say like a class A whole set image are likely representative of class A. So they're, Gonna be pretty different from the the, the most highly attended patches uh, from a slide as class B. So uh, my idea was just that you know, in addition to using a slide level label, can we propose some objective to uh, to to give us more supervision at the patch level? So the the what what I called instance level clustering, which is like you know, basically we use attention scores as a sort of pseudo labels where we take the top attended patches from each slide uh, for a particular class. And we use those. We use those as like sort of, um, uh, and we we ask the model to linearly discriminate them. So we ask the, the model to put the top attended patches from each class into different clusters, um, and, and and apart from also the the sort of the, the the lowest attended 
patches from that side. So then at the patch level, um, I can perhaps learn like a more discriminative boundary among the different uh, classes of patches um, in my data set, even though I don't have uh, labels technically for every single patch individually, if that makes sense. Yeah, so do you, um, do you in, empirically find that uh, with the clustering it actually, the model does better than uh, attention, pure attention on the model? Yeah, so there's two ways we tried to validate it. So one way was just that um, we used the, the, the instance level classifier that, you know, assigns like a, like a cluster for the patch level. We sort of use that to, we randomly sampled patches from each slide and then we passed them through that classifier uh, to, to sort of do the clustering. And then we go back and ex actually extract those patches and visualize that, oh, you know, are they actually representative of the different classes, right? Do they actually cap uh, um, capture morphology of the different classes? And we, we um, it's not perfect, but we, we were able to find that actually that's quite well. Like when we get those patches, get, the, get their embeddings and then, um, you know, visualize them in like, you know, uh, I, I believe we did PCA. Um, and you can see that they actually go into different, uh, they actually divide the, 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 the feature space. Uh, and then if you visualize the different clusters they actually correspond to different uh, morphologies. So that's one way we sort of visually um, analyzed it. And then uh, quantitatively, we did do like an ablation study. I believe it's in one of the supplementary tables that we have in the paper where you see that by having this additional objective, it gives you anywhere between, I wanna say like between one to 2% improvement to sometimes it could be upwards of like 5% uh, when you have like less data for certain tasks. So I think it's just like, it's like a nice trick that you can use to squeeze a little bit more out of your, uh, of your training. Um, but I will say that it's not, it's not ideal because it's, um, from my understanding to do the top K indexing, you have to do like at least like a partial sort over your, your, your bag. So like your sequence of patches. So when that bag size becomes large, you might be actually adding like a lot of overhead uh, to your training, which is you know, definitely unideal. So, um, you know, in practice, what I found is that like, I would always just run the, uh, the baseline. So just, you know, straight up attention, multiple instant learning with embedding. Um, and, you know, you can do tricks like uh, doing dropout, um, both on the, the sort of the intermediate layers as well as the attention scores and also um, make the model like larger and wider. And that typically can and uh, give you a better performance. And if that's still not enough, then you know, by all means, try uh, this technique as well uh, and to see if you can get a little bit more out of it. But, but yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's, that's basically how I um, view it. And, and of course, I think you know, at the time we came up with this framework, um, it was still like, sort of like the early days of like the computation pathology and wiki supervised learning. Um, since then, people have you know, tried to play around with like GCNs, like graph neural networks and um, more recently, people have also tried like transformers, um, so that can like model um, sort of dependencies um, and contacts between different patches in your slide. Um, and you know, for certain tasks, that might also um, give you a boost. And sometimes, but sometimes at the additional at the at the cost of like additional computational expenses. And for things like transformer, I'm not that familiar with the state of the art in terms of like how it's applied to. Um, computational pathology specifically. I know like I've read some papers because like the, the bags in your uh, whole set images are so big, right? Like the quadratic cost will just kill you if you try to use transformer on it. So people typically do like, you know, Nystrom approximation or like uh, linear, transform uh, linear, um, linear transformers to do some kind of approximation instead of using the vanilla self-attention. Um, but then it's like, I feel like people haven't really empirically validated um, how accurate those approximations are in the context of like, uh, competition pathology. So uh, it, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, and, and I will also note, sorry, I'm just, seems like I'm rambling, but the, I, in, in one of my slides, I mentioned that like, this is really like a two-stage approach, right? So the, your, what kind of learning algorithm you apply is definitely like one piece of the puzzle, but also like, let's not forget that all of this happens after you've already done embedding, right? On your, on your original data. Um, and that embedding, not only is it sort of arbitrary in the sense that like, oh, typically people just use like a pre-trained encoder, but it's also arbitrary in the sense that like, oh, you know, we, we took like fixed size crops um, out of some typically fixed size resolutions that we've artificially defined for our problem. 
So, you know, in essence, how we can further improve performance for certain tasks uh, in, in, in this field, I think it's going to have to come uh, from both the algorithms that happen or the learning algorithms that comes after the representation learning, but also the representation learning and the problem formulation itself. So it's really like a two-stage approach. At least that's sort of what it looks like um, is where the field is headed. Yeah, thanks so much for the very insightful comments. Yeah, I agree that um, um, moving forward, the field might want to think about like, uh, not just to, just based on the uh, fixed features uh, extracted from protein encoder, but also like, like find a way to actually back propagate. Um, or actually, there have been methods that can back propagate to the to the individual pixels, but I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, that that might be the future for this field. Yeah. All right. Um, is there any other question from the audience? Okay, if not, let's thank Max again for this very amazing talk. Thank you everyone for joining us today. And I just want to make a quick announcement that uh, next week we are going to take a break um, because we didn't really take a spring break um, two weeks ago. So yeah, um, happy spring break everyone um, and enjoying some sunshine and yeah. And we will see you in two weeks. And we will also right. upload the recording of uh, Max Talk later to our YouTube channel. Feel free to check it out. And if you have any questions, um, feel free to reach out to Max directly or reach out to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Max. Thank you. <laughs>